it's a little bit of a DNA change to understand that the world is going to go on without you and with you. Now the question is, with you, what difference can you make? Let's see in Workplace Mental Model for about 20 hours of investment in your education every week, which I wholeheartedly agree. And I, I don't use the word education. It's a 360, 360 development. Yeah. Just upgrade right. yourself. So for our point of view, we originated as the facilitator, mm-hmm. the technology partner, the content creator, the ability to be able to transpose an offline experience into online. She said, one fine day, just come for a drive with mm-hmm. me and I want to show you that there's a big water problem. Yeah. And we said, no, no, but we want to do something in education. She says, you're right. But first you come and see the water problem there. And then we realized that actually we don't solve the water problem. There's, you can't solve the education problem. You were sharing that, you know, some people play golf for their free time. You make movies in your free time. So I think it's about the stories that one wants to tell. Ronnie, welcome. Really looking forward to this conversation. I think when I was going through everything you've done, I think the word was coming to my mind is eternal entrepreneur. You know, in your 50s, you started Upgrad, which is now, you know, one of the largest ad tech you know, companies in the country doing really well. I think nearly profitable from what I understand, a unicorn. But, you know, in 50s, when people start to slow down, you will think about, you know, being on board position and investors and doing something for impact. You do all of that and you're yet you have the energy and passion to build a company, you know, which is really leading the pack in its industry. Let, let's go all the way back to when you started. I think you've been now building companies for over four decades. When you started out, did you have some kind of game plan in mind or vision for yourself, you know, that how your life will unfold and the kind of projects will do? Like, how did it pan out? So firstly, look, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it and really enjoy this conversation. Keep it interactive. I think for the first time, somebody used a very different word called <laughs> eternal entrepreneur <laughs> rather than uh, serial entrepreneur. Right. And I, I don't like the word serial. Uh-huh. Because I think it sounds like a premeditated approach that you want to move from one thing to another. And, and you do things in parallel anyway. And I think, and I think the concurrent, <laughs> So you can do things consecutively right. and do it concurrently. Mm-hmm. And I think when people say I do multiple things, I think I would like to say I do some things concurrently. Right. I think some of them are actually connected with mm-hmm. each other. And I think I'm half answering your question right. with that in the first place. But I think, you know, it is a little bit of a myth that at 50 and 60, you want to sit on boards mm-hmm. and otherwise sit margaritas on the beach. <laughs> because um, at the end of the day, I think all of us, if you've led an active life yeah. in a certain particular manner, right. I think you want to pursue that. Mm-hmm. Frankly, today in the 21st century, at any given stage, the amount of things that are happening overall mm-hmm. and the opportunities that are happening mm-hmm. and the diversities that are happening, you have actually you have an opportunity to become 10 years younger every mm-hmm. 10 years. Right. I think maybe 20 years mm-hmm. back, you had an opportunity to be 10 years older right. every 10 years. Mm-hmm. So if you ask me, where's my energy coming mm-hmm. from? I think it's because... The world is changing at such a rapid pace. Yeah. And with that, it's not just technology. Mm-hmm. It's actually the consumer. It's all yeah. of us. Yeah. We're changing. Mm-hmm. And because of that, the opportunity mm-hmm. that it does. To me, I think mm-hmm. the opportunity to be younger every 10 years rather than yeah. older every 10 years is well, what that's amazing. I think. Morning. That's a great phrase to keep in mind. And I, you know, my huge health, fitness, you know, enthusiast. So I did totally relate to today. We understand so much about human biology and aging lifespans are continuing to increase yeah. Yeah. and no longer you know it's in everything it's not just in business mm-hmm. I mean exactly that the, the the depth of yoga and its acceptance of mind and yeah. peace of mind the acceptance of balance right. otherwise it used to be an HR matter of one's mm-hmm. work life balance but yeah. today when people look at balance mm-hmm. it's a multiplicity of balance right. that can get you going you can still be doing an 18 hour day when having a work life right. balance mm-hmm. Because the balance for you might be mm-hmm. five other different things. Right. It's not always only mm-hmm. how much time did I spend with one person. So I think I'm going to come back to that. You know the balance, and you know maybe if you if you, if you have yoga in your life. But I want to go back to you know just start. You know when you started your career, uh, Ronnie. You know you know I think in the 80s you were building companies uh, in entertainment space. What was your vision for yourself? Because the reason I'm saying it, a lot of people in their 20s will be watching this. And, you know, obviously everyone's inspired by, you know, everything you've done and continue to do. But uh, Ronnie in his 20s, what was the thought process at that time? Ronnie in his 20s was naive, uh-huh. was um, opportunistic. Uh-huh. But I think one thing I was very clear about, or two things maybe I was very clear about, is not having a plan B. Uh-huh. 
which means really going after the plan A. And my best example for I can, that I can give is the optionality after I managed to convince my parents at that time that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and otherwise very professional run family. My mm -hmm. pro brother's done his PhD. My dad was always been a professional in his mm -hmm. job. Was his optionality where he said, okay, if you want to finally do that, why don't you first do an MBA or a yeah. chartered accountancy and then do that? Mm -hmm. And to me, that would have been having a plan B, which mm -hmm. means that at the end of two years, three years, I always had this comfort zone yeah. that I could always relapse and go back to what I tanked up on. So I think that I was very clear about. Okay. And I think the second one I was very clear, which propelled me was, I'm not great at implementing somebody else's vision. Now, that could have been an early thought for me, but it was an early thought for me. And that's when you feel, it's not like I want to build something on my own. So I think, and if you ask me at that stage, the scary part for my parents was when they asked me, so what exactly do you want to do? I think today everyone says I have a great idea or I have a great business or I have a great this. And my second answer to them was, I'm not quite sure. All I do know is I want to be uh, working for myself. I want to create something. I'm not sure what it was. Right. So you had clarity about being independent, like yeah. doing your own thing. Also a reasonable comfort, comfort with risk. You were not afraid of trying something or, you know. So that's, an, that's a very important point. Because risk can be looked at in two mm -hmm. ways, right? And I think today when people are so feeling entitled, mm -hmm. the risk is losing out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My risk was I got nothing to lose. <laughs> right, right. So I think risk has to be looked at as in a very, very different right. way. And today also, today in whatever I'm doing, yeah. and yes, I may have a little bit more resources, a little bit more failures behind yeah. me, therefore a lot more experiences. But it's still the decision is more about mm -hmm. what have I got to do. So at that stage, my mm -hmm. risk was I got nothing to do. Mm -hmm. And my parting statement from my parents at that stage when I embarked on that journey is I said, go ahead. But look, if anything comes in your way and you are f failing, we can't bail you out. <laughs> right. So when you get that sense, yeah. any sense of entitlement mm -hmm. in your life Goes just disappears. Right. And and that's a great way to start. And you knew, as you said, you had no plan B also. So yeah. it's just I think that's quite important. Mm -hmm. And I know most people think, what do you mean? Because yeah. you do in life need plan right. Bs. Now, I know... Management school tells yeah. you all the time to have bad mm -hmm. knees, and I'm not being, I'm not being facetious yeah. about that. Uh, what I meant is, the more you have a plan A, yeah. actually the intensity with which you try and make it work yeah. is much harder. Yeah, I mean, one way I'll interpret is, you know, the moment you have plan B, some part of your brain is always, you know, in it's some comfort the, zone. The left eye is always right. looking, looking at that, right? And especially when the things get tougher, and that's where I think I'm sure it will come out later. Which, I mean, you had had incredible success but I'm pretty sure there were you know incredible lot of failure. lows as well right so in those you know failure time if there's a plan be ready for waiting for you and look I would say I mean a lot of people ask me today oh we're on angel investment mm -hmm. you know what should I do and what I get and I said first just understand one thing the failures will come first the write-offs will come first, first the upsides will come that's right yeah because the companies that make it you know big they take 10 to 15 years but failure happened in the first 2-4 years so you have you know yeah. your yeah. portfolio you know, yeah. starts to go down uh, yeah so, you know, see, a lot of people, you know, when let's say they start an entrepreneurial journey in 20s or 30s and sometimes something works big and there's also um, many people choose to nothing wrong with that to just keep building that for next, you know, three, four decades, yeah. become chairman of that company. Sure. But you have, you know, kind of reached the peak, exit it, build something again from scratch, you know, reach the peak and multiple right. times over. So when something's going really well, you have, you know, overcome all the hurdles, things are working. What is the thought process? Like, what you know propels you to find next thing and go all the way to ground zero to rebuild it? So, firstly, I would say it's not premeditated. Mm -hmm. So, I would say I wasn't ready to call it a day in media mm -hmm. at that particular point yeah. in time, but it was serendipitous mm -hmm. and opportunistic yeah. because I had a great shareholder in Disney. Mm -hmm. They were on our board. I was active with them, and they popped the question of why don't we put it all yeah. together? And I think it made compelling logic. And I think if there are two mottos in which I have lived by in life, one of them is all glory is fleeting mm -hmm. because right. actually that's a very important yeah. and it's quite a loaded right. statement. And I think the second one from that perspective is yeah. there's a big difference between being passionate about what you do and being yeah. emotional about right. what you do. That's right. And I think most of us get a little bit more emotional. Mm -hmm. So I think at that stage, it just sounded like the absolute right thing mm -hmm. to do. At that stage, did I have a very clear plan? Now, what am I going to do for the next 20 years? Not Fair. a yeah. So I think when you look at that, uh, and you know, when I exited, I would say it was not a good word. Uh, it was definitely, the word was abandoned, not exit. <laughs> I think maybe when people like you and Flipkart and everyone else actually created value and started selling, everyone became aspirational. At that time, was, I, was, I was walking out on people kind of situation. 
But so that's one part. Yeah. The reason why you finish a particular thing, it's not premeditated. Actually, if it's premeditated, mm -hmm. you're in trouble. Right. Because if you're really going to create value, if mm -hmm. you're only going to create value if somebody else comes to you. If you're going to somebody else to exit, yeah. it doesn't work that way. So I think that's the big nuance in terms of that. The fact of starting all over yeah. again, that's a that's a DNA thing for mm -hmm. each one individually for what we want to do. And I would say for that one year after I moved out of yeah. media and entertainment totally, because there was a mm -hmm. two-year transition mm -hmm. where I looked at the combined thing. Um, I did a few investments, mm -hmm. and very good ones, and very happy with that, work with entrepreneurs. But again, the flashback of 20 mm -hmm. years back when I asked the same question myself, I'm not good at implementing somebody mm -hmm. else's vision. Right. So to me, the excitement of just being an yeah. investor and talking to entrepreneurs, if they took four or five of my ideas, mm. that I would be worried because right. it's, we're backing that person's right. vision. So while that's exciting, mm. to me, it was not gr totally gratifying right. to be a catalyst. Mm. I think I wanted to roll up my sleeves and leave something of my own. In the business that I run, I actually work very well as a catalyst. Right. So I would say the reason one went through and created something at scale in media yeah. because media can be something where you're going to be easily sucked into the creative mm -hmm. process or this process yeah. or sales process. So I think my role as a CEO and a founder was being a catalyst. Yeah. But when I get to the investment part, it didn't interest me. Got it. Now I can see a lot of parallel. I think I agree with you that you can build something with the intention of you know exiting because like for example, for me personally, Mintra, there was never a plan to exit. At some point, stars align in a way Absolutely. where you know merger flip cut was the best possible thing to stars do. Stars align, serendipity, opportunity. Right. Those are the only ways to do. I think if anyone is looking at a premeditated yeah. move, the biggest flaw is I'd be confused. Who am I building this company for? Mm. Because you're building it as per your vision. Right, that's right. But if you start planning an exit, you have to start actually become a third mm -hmm. person and say, who am I building it for? Right. Then you look at a target person who's mm. going to acquire you yeah. and building for that. It's a right royal mess. Yeah, I think both of us are agreeing to the fact. I think a lot of entrepreneurs also watch, you know, this is podcast is when you're building it, you have to believe that you're building for the rest of your life. Absolutely. If anything else happens, it happens. You know, Absolutely. that's, you know, but you can't think of, you know, this whole idea of flipping it five years, seven years, yeah. seven years. You can up position building. things differently. Right. But I think if anyone's setting out with a timetable, yeah. it's a disaster. Right, right, right. Which, you know, you would have seen now this timetable thing, you know, is interesting as, uh, you know, see, uh, this whole venture industry works on fixed timeline. You've also, you know, uh, built a fund also along the way. And so company building is a very long process while the people you raise money from, they have a very finite exit window. What are your thoughts on that? You know, does that, I mean, at some level, your access to capital is great. But that's but, the ecosystem. Mm. That is the ecosystem because the, the what you would call the, the funding ecosystem versus the strategic yeah. ecosystem is one which will always have a calendar right. because everyone needs a return. Yeah. So I think actually that's a good healthy mix mm. because it forces you to have a timetable and a churn. Right. It's a little bit like at some stage, some of even your best executives, mm. they might be, you'll have to move them into a completely different thing or move for some change. Yeah. So I think a change in that is on your cap table, there's mm. nothing wrong with that. It actually puts a little bit of good positive pressure mm -hmm. on you. And if if you are well planned, mm -hmm. you're not looking at therefore changing the course of the company. Mm -hmm. You're looking at a new, bringing in somebody new for yeah. somebody who wants to exit. Mm -hmm. So the optionalities out there are pretty there. So I don't think because somebody's coming in with a seven year window yeah. that should psych you. Mm -hmm. You have to go out and build what you want to right. build. Yeah. The probability in that period of having a secondary market mm -hmm. is fair. And if yeah. it's not, people will wait. Right. But in seven years, if you have not found other people who are equally interested yeah. in your company, then there's something wrong with you. Right. Fair. So you're saying, you know, there are different it's set of investors fact. who are interested in different stages of company, different risk reward profile. Yeah. And therefore, you know, it's just maybe investors are, you know, kind of temporary passenger on the bus, but you are the one who are kind of building for long. Yeah. Right? And temporary should not be used as a loose word because actually seven years. It's fairly. I mean, there's a reason why everyone says seven year age also. Right. <laughs> right, right. Fair. Fair. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go back to your race study again because, you know, I personally also, you know, have gone through the journey and this after Flipkart when I started CureFit, it was so painful for six months, you know, because from the 5,000 people organization, you are down to five people organization and nothing will move, you know, everyone look at everything comes back everything to you. Comes back to you and I'm again going through a kind of a similar transition now. It's not uh, not pretty. I mean, partly I also enjoy that's why I'm doing it. It's not forced. So how was your experience in going back to early stage and you know, just doing things with your own hands, you know, 
first yeah, 12 to 18th. That's years. candidly a mixed one. Yeah. Because it is true that when you want to do zero to one yeah. all over again, mm. the at least 50% of the things are tasks that you've already done before. Yeah. And it's not challenging. Yeah. And you're not learning anything mm. more. Right. Uh, but that's your choice of zero to one. Mm. Because there are lots of challenges if you take something from five to 10, because mm. you don't know what happened in the zero to five. Yeah. So you might be spending a lot more time solving other people's problems mm -hmm. there also. But I do agree. I think sometimes it works because if you get co-founders, mm -hmm. then you balance on what you think you're good at and somebody mm -hmm. else is good at. Or you quickly build a team around the things that, you know, yeah. these things I don't want to do as mm -hmm. a task. Yeah. It doesn't work out on timetable, mm -hmm. but it more or less gives you that balance. Right. right. Uh, you know, uh, I think after UTV and before Upgrade, you were running his Unilazer Ventures. I think you did some incredible, you know, investment, I think, you know, some of them exceedingly well. So, which means you were able to bet on the right people probably gave, you know, right inputs as well. What are, what are your takeaways? And what was your learning about who makes, in your eyes, who is a good entrepreneur? What trades? Because you have a limited time to decide, you know, whether yeah. who to invest behind. So, what are some of the key things that you were, you know, looking for when you were betting on people? Yeah, I have to say amongst Anything else that I've done from media mm -hmm. to upgrad to our not-for-profit foundation, I, I wouldn't consider me wearing an investor hat being my strongest mm -hmm. link. So it's been a lot more intuitive. Mm -hmm. But I've looked at it not wearing an investor hat yeah. on, but wearing an entrepreneur hat okay. on. And maybe I think that gave me that differentiator to just spot people where one could see in the DNA of your own mm -hmm. versus the normal conventional way of first understanding how large is the addressable mm -hmm. market, therefore what's the consumer price, what's the price sensitivity, what can happen here, what's the window, what's the company landscape. So I think, you know, maybe five years, ten years back, I would look for problem solvers mm -hmm. and people with the right attitude as entrepreneurs. But today I would look for problem spotters. Mm -hmm. I think nobody's got time to solve problems. Uh -huh. You have to either spot a problem and actually yeah. preempt it mm -hmm. because by the time you solve a problem, somebody else has overtaken you. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and for me, I think that sense of... Um, what I would call hyperness that, mm -hmm. that stays with. There is some sense of a tentative, yeah. a tenuousness in mm -hmm. an entrepreneur that I think for me that energy is very important where mm -hmm. you're edgy to an extent that right. you are you are constantly a little bit on that mm -hmm. process where it keeps you nimble, it yeah. keeps you very open-minded. Yeah. So I think attitude, approach, mm -hmm. open-mindedness is very, very, very critical mm -hmm. because you're going to go through lots of ups and downs. Yeah. And how you deal with them mm -hmm. and how do you retain that is yeah. going to be quite important. Right. I think the other one is also, if you're coming in, people need to respect the ecosystem. A lot of people think this is mine mm -hmm. and they talk in the first person and then everyone else is a periphery in the support yeah. structure. That doesn't work. Right. If the, the minute you're not 100% shareholder of your company, it stops being your company. Yeah. You're a shareholder and you're a founder or CEO. Mm -hmm. So I think seeing DNA of people mm -hmm. there also segregates because that means that they will be open to feedback, uh -huh. they'll be open to learn, yeah. and the ecosystem will change. Mm -hmm. Now, I think those were elements for me, but again, with full uh, mm -hmm. caveat that amongst all of what I think I've done, I, this is my this, this is not something that I've really spent that much time. And shopping. yet it has done very well. I mean, Lenskart is you know, obviously one of your portfolio companies, the others. So done really well. Right. Yes. And, and there were a couple of others. I did something in Agri and one or two others. Mm -hmm. They've, three or four of them really worked out very well. Lenskart obviously worked out exceptionally well because it's a very early stage. But you were kind of alluded to that you know, dilemma that if you're working with investing behind really good founders, they probably don't need too much input and nudge from you. If they need a lot of inputs from that's you, that's probably right. That's a worrisome. Yeah. That's a worrisome because you're... It's your job to back somebody else's vision. Mm. And then you go back them, then you can ask them some hard yeah. questions. And I think what I would bring to the mm. table was more empathy for entrepreneurship rather than what's your, when's your next fundraise, when's your next secondary, mm -hmm. what do we do here? So that narrative would be different. I would say I never was a board member in any of my investing mm -hmm. companies, still don't. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily attend yeah. the board meeting, not because I think those are not, those are necessary yeah. and important. But the value and I can do at those is very different from what happens at a board meeting. Right. Fair, fair. So you have a more like one-on-one -on -one in depth yeah. discussion and have a, you know, just Because that's my strength. Mm -hmm. I can put myself in that person's yeah. shoes. I can, we can narrate and work with right. that. I think that that's a much more different value add. Right. And entrepreneurs are also able to probably able to relate to you as an operator, right? Because you're in the same situation. And you to yeah. open up, right? Because like if, they're, if they're trying to position space, right? themselves, and I think with an investor, there's an element where I'm not saying you're being uh, non-transparent, yeah. but you're positioning mm -hmm. 
the entire thought process. You're not talking about your deepest problems yeah. and deepest challenges because the last thing you want to do is have them walk all over you because now you've done full disclosure. Right. That doesn't mean you should not do the right disclosures, yeah. but I'm saying what's going on in your mind, mm. the soft issues is right. where I think I've enjoyed my interaction. And I think, um, would you agree that in the, especially early part, you know, it's it's um, also mind game in the head of the entrepreneur because so much goes on, you know, you have sometimes even self-esteem issues, you have founder dynamic issues, you know, you are trying to second guess what investors want, maybe things are not working and just so much, you know, in the, we get so confused in our own head, right? Yes, so do you see is. that, you know? There's a lot of contradictions, right. lots and lots of contradictions and I think that's, that's a good place because I would say one dealt with that for the first 20 years so I can totally, totally relate to yeah. the fact of the crossroads right. and actually pose questions to that person that says, it's almost the person would say, how did you know? And I'm saying, no, I didn't know. I just know that in a situation like this, this is how it would be. Fair, yeah. So, let me zooming out, you know, you've been, you know, this company building experience in many different domains over a long period of time, including working with some of the other entrepreneurs, etc. So, you've been a kind of both participant, uh, significant participant in the whole you know, entrepreneurial ecosystem in India, which in many ways has come of age. Yeah. So what, and I think when, back when you started, there was no ecosystem to speak of. I can't even imagine in the 80s and 90s, what was it like to try to build a company in the country, right? But uh, what's your sense of, you know, where we are in this ecosystem, you know, what do you like about it? What still needs to get better uh, for just, you know, entrepreneurs to continue to, you know, in some ways, uh, play a significant role in their developers? I think the enthusiasm is there and that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think the optimism is very good. Mm -hmm. I worry about it mm -hmm. because optimism without realism is a big problem. Mm. Being too realistic yeah. will make you conservative. Mm. But right now, we're a little bit in the optimism stage. And this is not just based on anything to do with yeah. fundraising. It's just the normal context here mm -hmm. seems to be, we're in a great market, everything mm -hmm. is great, we're yeah. going to be this thing and whatever else. Yeah. So I think optimism with realism is something that I would say is needed. Um, but the the, some of the issues that I may have faced long time back are totally relevant today, right? Where I would say mostly the the family pressure, the stigma of being an entrepreneur is very positive. It's a very, very positive yeah. aspiration, I think. Uh, television shows, the Prime Minister Startup India program has just brought it out of the closet, so to speak. Um, and I think the funding ecosystem has only mm -hmm. done that. And that, that's the second part. I think when I started off, there was no context of any sense. Yeah. There were no angels, there was no... <laughs> Demons, there was nobody, <laughs> so to speak. So I think um, you work in an ecosystem. Yeah. But what I learned as a humongous asset for me mm -hmm. at that time. And some of these, you know, these are all uh, mental models or mind state. How does a new aspiring entrepreneur cultivate some of these things, you know, not having sense of entering? Because a lot of people might have gone to good colleges, might come from Because you stop reading anything in the media. <laughs> right. Because when you read some, all the, everything that happens and talks mm -hmm. about in the media, it's very one-sided. Yeah. Not for any reason. Mm -hmm. They're doing whatever they're yeah. doing. But it's one-sided because always it talks about is funding and investors and whatever yeah. else and makes it sound like your badge of honor is only mm -hmm. that. But right. I would say 99 or 100 people mm -hmm. here, so don't consume the media. Right. Look at some of the other people because mm -hmm. they're incredible in the small and medium scale in the SME sector. Mm -hmm. In many other impact sectors, yeah. There's a lot of people doing incredible work mm -hmm. where nobody's looked at it. So it's that 1% that gets the spotlight yeah. because you're trying to do something attractive mm -hmm. that is going to attract funding and then make you look like a success yeah. without having actually built a successful mm -hmm. business. Yeah. Whereas there are 99 others who are actually going about meticulously mm -hmm. at their own pace building what they believe to be long-term successful mm -hmm. businesses. Yeah. And I think I wish we could shine a light mm. on the 99 yeah. because that's happening. Mm. So if you ask me today in the ecosystem, a lot more optimism, right. but a lot less realism, mm. much more sense of entitlement mm. than when I started off. Yeah. And that worries me because mm. I think that will, that allow, that's going to trip people yeah. along the way. And third is I think we're too center stage on the 1% mm. that are doing things in the what we would call glamorous yeah. world of what media covers versus the 99 others right. who are doing some incredible work in India. No, no, absolutely. And some of these things, I think, you know, some of the aspiring entrepreneurs can consider as a, as a warning or things to avoid. One is, you know, you know, when you start, you know, it doesn't matter what you've done because this is all going to be about that particular problem and just solving that, you know, right. past grades or past, you know, accomplishment, yeah. including, you know, I mean, when I, when I started a new company, you know, whatever, in the past 
doesn't matter you know i may have some resources yeah. but that's another problem you know fully fresh and second i think india you are right there are lots of businesses people have you know this 50 crore 100 crore profit business they build bootstrap never is money yeah. like you know yeah. zeroda is you know one example yeah. of that which is now you know pretty well known but it was not that well known and there you know and and many others so i think you know studying those models you put some of the injection take some of the inject the yeah. steroids out from here and put those steroids here it would be a very different business than some of the other people yeah and maybe that's you know some of the advice for some of the even venture guys also it tends to you know just follow one narrative any given time and yeah. maybe you know that whole can be also more diversified in going after some of these businesses but that narrative is not your narrative and that's the narrative that's being followed right, right. now it's not your narrative it's yeah. the investor narrative right. it's the media narrative yeah. based on that your social mm. narrative and therefore the pressure around it is like mm. school kids right? right i mean you want to compete and your as parents you want your kid to do well right. and if you look at the that environment you can call it toxic you can call it competitive you can call it whatever else but today i think that's it's a similar to that environment is too much pressure yeah but when you follow that narrative the challenges narrative also changes last four years you know there was a crypto narrative and then metaverse narrative and then d2c narrative and that changes but as a founder you need to believe in that narrative for 10 20 years yep. irrespective of you know yep. whether investors have so i think that's probably yeah one and i know I, i just a couple of the other days i was explaining i said look if 10 years back when i was starting in education i would call it ed.com <laughs> then i call it ed tech because tech Correct. and now i'll call it ed ai yeah, that's right <laughs> i mean so these are just nomenclatures and right. we all follow that right. none of them actually make sense because you have to do what you want mm. to do So let's talk about education. Actually, so in 2015, when you started, you know, upgrade education, you know, wasn't sexy by any stretch of imagination. Uh, you be honest. In 2016, I thought about education somewhere. My, you know, I was not able to figure out a good starting point, as well as you know, had doubts about the size of market, etc. In terms of organized yeah. play, but you spotted something. You know, just what were your motivations? You know, why did you pick? And I mean, you've stayed with this now nearly. Nine, ten years in that journey and doing incredible. So just we walk me through that you know thought process of choosing and also the choices you made in education. Everyone typically goes after in your know, tuition market or yeah. Yeah. exam prep market and so on. But you chose something very unconventional at the time. So I think first choices was co-founders, and I think you know uh, I needed someone who understood this with a lot more depth. So I think you know that worked very well and get the right co-founders. Mm-hmm. I think then the vision gets. explored from that nature so i think the ability and the narrative of yeah. being in higher education uh-huh. and in with a very clear idea that this is going to be the next 20 years uh-huh. so the beauty was and the beauty and the beast if i were to ask that <laughs> was that you couldn't describe what your total addressable market uh-huh. or your tam was yeah. because it's to be discovered uh-huh. because how many working professionals are going back to college yeah. to study zero uh-huh. so what's your total addressable market zero uh-huh. so that was the opportunity and i think in media and entertainment i faced that same part when i got in there the definition was not even mm-hmm. media and entertainment yeah. it was then called and evolved there so i think at that stage the idea was really to be in the market where over a period of the next 20 30 years uh-huh. every single person will either need to be a generalist or a specialist or both uh-huh. everyone will need to upgrade themselves every yeah. 3 to 4 to 5 years in some sense of specialization or topping up in their role yeah either as individuals in their career or as corporates wanting to do that yeah. so if you look at that market and this is not just india it's around the world it's even in the western markets because here we have different benchmarks in the western markets is 10 times more competitive yeah. the 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 changes 10 times more rapid so that each one has their own vietnam has their own need india has their own need china has their own need mm-hmm. us would have their own need so i think just that opportunity and education is a bit of a uh calendar event word right mm-hmm. because education first word that comes to your mind would be curriculum yeah would be calendar yeah. you know it's like one of those mm-hmm. quiz contests and you say first three words that come to your mind right. education so obviously sexy doesn't come with calendar mm-hmm. and whatever else but disrupting a sector mm-hmm. like that not in its form mm-hmm. because i think it's important a lot of people have shown automobiles in 1920 and automobiles in 2020 and said look at the change and everyone looked at a classroom with a bench yeah. and said 100 years later but actually that's a fact from mm. another 100 years later that bench is not going to change right. because some sense of basic curriculum you'll have to you'll have to follow yeah but today when you look at most people mm. 20 years back when you were doing a curriculum and you asked a professor they would know what you want to teach because they can see 10 years later what is relevant Today, I think it's a very different way in which 
knowledge, mm -hmm. information, skilling is going to get this thing because you can't predict the 20 years later. Those habits are going to be in every sense, social sense, cultural sense, technology sense, consumer sense, knowledge sense, 20 years later. That is when you're starting to teach, yeah. you're teaching for the forward, right. but you need to know the forward. So to me, that was the exciting part of really disrupting a sector yeah. where you have to look at trends every five years. Excellent. And I think for all the failures that we had in media, the times we succeeded mm -hmm. was when we looked at mm -hmm. forward-looking trends right. and we could be ahead of a trend. Yeah. So I think you packed a number of, I think, very important lessons. Right? One is you're not following the heart. Heart, you know, it was not the next, you know, cool thing. It was, again, you know, unconventional choice at that time. Other is also realizing that, you know, the world we are living in is changing very, very fast. And the idea of you get educated once yeah. and be done with it for the rest of your life it's gone. is uh, obsolete. So then how do you solve it? Like the colleges are not trying to teach people in their, you know, late 20s, 30s, 40s. And that's, I think, it's, I, mean, I agree with you. It's a huge imperative. You know, today, anyone who is not learning actively is being just left behind you. Yep. It's just you'll become obsolete, you know, like yeah. a modern day dinosaur in some ways. They're not employable. They're, They're not really not employable. Yeah, yeah. But you know, but look, it's also very hard say when people in their, you know, again, you know, late twenties, thirties, they start to have a family, you know, they have financial commitments, maybe young kids to take care of. What is your advice to people to, you know, what's a good rule of thumb to how much time one should find to keep reinvesting in your, you know, upgrading your skills and learning because otherwise slowly you are getting obsolete you know whatever your reason of not finding a time may be like how should one think of a modern professional like investing? I would just say you don't have a choice because you really don't have a choice yeah. the question of job security mm -hmm. maybe in government there's job security yeah. around the world and mm -hmm. that's 25% of the largest employer in the world is mm -hmm. the government <clears throat> but if you take the government out of there yeah. there are no job guarantees mm -hmm. today so actually in being in a job is as risky as being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. because right. there are no guarantees in both mm -hmm. It's not a lottery either which way, but it's not a guarantee. Yeah, entrepreneurship, entre you're learning a lot of skills. Yes. You can so there you're in a little bit in more control of your own destiny yeah. and you can look at your skills and then you can put mm. that together. So it's exactly that. If you were a person that was running your own entity, yeah. you would get specialists. Mm. But as an individual in your career, you'll have to look at it in that same manner. Yeah. You, your left brain, somewhere down the line, you will need to be able to be a lot more 360 mm -hmm. today than you have ever been. Just being, I'm great at sales, is going to be a cap. Yeah, yeah. If I'm just great at marketing, it is mm -hmm. going to be a crap. You can still be great marketing and creative, but if you haven't understood technology, if you haven't understood how consumers need to be looked at today, then how you looked at it only with focus groups and right. surveys mm -hmm. five years back, you're up, up the wrong way. Yeah. Third, if you're not a business mm -hmm. um, adder along with marketing, you're out okay. because the ROI is today on every cost of expenditure yeah. is becoming harder, faster. And yeah. And so the 360 degree approach is really what people need right. to be. So what will you advise? How much time, let's say someone, let's focus on somebody in the 30s where you know, you've got 10, 15 year career behind you. How much time on a weekly basis or monthly basis you should spend in just continuous upgrading? Yourself? I think 20% of, your of your waking life. 20% of your waking life. And it does not mean it needs to be formatted. Mm -hmm. But formatted or unformatting, whichever way you want to. And let me make sure you're using waking life deliberately, not working life because eight hours yes. versus 16 hours. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So almost yes. like three I'm hours. Accounting, because working life is a very subjective point right. for a lot so of So let me do the math, right? You know, 16 hours, let's say. I think, I think most people should sleep seven to eight hours. So 16 hours, you know, 20% um, of that is three hours a day or seven is 20 hours. So. 20 hours a week ballpark yeah. is the investment. I would I negotiate to 17 hours or right. 16 hours. I would say 17 hours. 7 hours is also good. Right. But yeah, 20% of that. Exactly. 7 hours works. You know, if you have like good meditation routine and somehow yeah. you get a very high quality sleep, sure, yeah. But excuse me, I'm telling you today, meditation is part of the whole knowledge curve. Mm. So I think if you look at that as not part of the 20%, yeah. I would count it in mm. the 20%. Fair. Yeah. Because internalizing right. is also learning. Right. Because you will get 40 questions answered mm -hmm. with one hour of silence yeah. that may save you a lot of time and trouble about mm -hmm. five other career moves you have been wasted to right. take mm -hmm. because you're worried about something yeah. else yeah, I think this is one I think you're uh, I think Ronnie's very very important message so I want to dwell more on this 
let's see in work is mental model of about 20 hours of investment in your education every week which i wholeheartedly agree and i, I don't use the word education it's a 360 360 development yeah. just upgrade right. yourself upgrade yourself which may be about your brain about your body about the knowledge about the skills because it's connected not right. because your body is mm-hmm. different and yeah. your brain is different it's all connected yeah so you're continuously you know, upgrading yourself and you yeah. have to find that time and most people today may not be even spending the for a lot of people the account may be you know zero. So maybe if one anyone who's listening to this, I'll advise that just do a mental calculation of last you know ten weeks. What is your average? Is it zero? Is it ten? Is it twenty? If it is anything you know in single digits, yeah, then you are in trouble. Like you have to really start yeah. thinking about changing your life. Yeah, I would say that do the maths, but also do the segregation of which was the highest ROIs and even your downtime of what you want to do. Because I think we mm. we. We need to disregard, it's not just the formal learning of that. You're challenging yourself, your clarity of thought, yeah. just getting, simplifying things mm-hmm. sometimes in your decision-making process yeah. is a upgrading yourself. Right. Because I think we complicate too many matters, then we get into multitasking. Mm-hmm. Then there's this entire world of distraction. Mm-hmm. And before we, if you're talking about two hours, yeah. your, your, your distraction, minimum distraction levels today are two hours a day. Yeah. Imagine if you trade your mm. two hours of distraction, which actually doesn't really get you going. Yeah. It really does. Because if you, mm. I asked you to remember how many of your Instagrams or news or <laughs> this or that you consume that you retain, mm. very low. Yeah. yeah. So th- that means part of this 20 hours means you need to have some completely distraction free time as well, where you are with your own thoughts, with maybe pen and pencil or yeah. just think it through and clarify. Or go for a run or go for a swim and come up back with that. Whatever. So one is the approach yeah. and technique of that balance mm-hmm. of mind. Yeah. To simplify your life, to prioritize it. I think today it is true that when most people say I can fail, but nobody can take away my knowledge. Mm. It's a fair statement. Yeah. Mm. But today I think you need to be smart and yeah. not just yeah. uh, intelligent. Because knowledge is getting obsolete. I really think fast. today if you're only intelligent and not smart, it's not a good enough. Yeah. And also, you know, what does even intelligence mean? Like today now we are going to be in some ways co living with all these AI tools. So that my intelligence is not only mine, but also what I'm able to use and what I'm able to do yeah. with that, right? So it's also not True. just one definite. And not thing. making too much of AI. And it is definitely a tool that's going to yeah. completely disrupt in many ways, but yeah. not as the level at which I think people are saying they will disrupt today. But you know how to handle these situations right. here. Yeah. Because I think one of the dangers in this pressure life of yeah. ours is the what I would call the mental toll it takes. Mm. And I think that's an important message, at least yeah. I would like to communicate, because because of that, yeah. you get into such a whirlwind mm-hmm. on your balance of time right. that sometimes you compartmentalize mm-hmm. yourself, and that yeah. actually adds to the stress. Right. And then the second one is your mental health is very important, mm-hmm. because if you if you start feeling low mm-hmm. in your self-esteem, yeah. that 20 hours will feel like 80 hours. Mm-hmm. But if you're not, and you have that self-confidence and yeah. simplicity, even if you do four hours, mm-hmm. it'll feel like 20 right. hours. So I think today we have to watch out because a lot of the younger generation mm-hmm. decides to feel defeated mm-hmm. or low or depressed very soon. Very so, soon. So when is this talk about what can people do? Partly I'm mean, getting right is bit of it is just about eliminating things. You just can't chase eliminate them. what other people think of you. Just <laughs> right. eliminate yeah, that. That's right. And eliminate distractions. Yeah. You can eliminate these two things. Right. I think that's a phenomenal starting point. Yeah. It's like losing eight kilos right. overnight. Yeah. Earlier, you know, I came across this, you know, these days, you know, we hear a lot about this FOMO, fear of missing out. I came across this, you know, joy of missing out. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but if people are able to incorporate that, yeah. like, I really, like, personally, I just share with you, Ronnie, is, I've, you know, I, I'm not recommending it's a great thing to do, but I've stopped going out for evening events. I don't go. Like, people stop inviting me also. Yeah. But that, you know, frees up my evening, you know, I can use it. How it's your personal choice. Right. And that's what you, you've, you've done it. Right. It, it was very good when it yeah. happened. Right. And now... You have a different ROI on your right, time. That's right, that's right, yeah. So, you know, one is that part, is investment in personal growth. I'm, I'm still, you know, uh, after 20 hours. But what else people can do? Like, what are your advice and kind of things one can do in terms of, I don't know, courses, reading, mentors? Like, just one broad set of tools one can consider adopting to leverage that 20 hours well. Yeah, I think this this one sense is definitely to step out of your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people... Part of the situation today is acceptance. Mm. Do we accept that we need to yeah. do something different? And if you can, most people stop at acceptance. Mm-hmm. You have to cross that bridge of acceptance. Yeah. I think once you do, you'll find your own. Whether mm. it's a podcast, it's a combination of things, yeah. right? I mean, people will pick up three things from this podcast right. and come up with three yeah. points. It might be a one-hour podcast, mm. but they'll 
if three minutes of that was relevant for them, that's right. good. So when people ask me about books, mm-hmm. I say I read chapters, not mm-hmm. books, because I think sometimes you just glean one or two yeah. things from a book. I don't think I've totally read a book in a long time, yeah. uh, unless it's fiction, because otherwise it'd be silly right. to read half a book with <laughs> this right. fiction. But in nonfiction, it's chapters, it's nuggets, it's lines, is what you want to do. Right. So I think, yeah, absorbing to an extent of being curious enough to actually be out there yeah. in the market. That doesn't mean you need to socialize. Right. So I agree with you. I'm I'm as reclusive a person as the next person, <laughs> even though it sounds quite different because I'm coming from media and entertainment. Right. The assumption is, how can you be reclusive in a sector like that? Yeah, I'm imagining all these Bollywood parties that you host. Exactly. So that's far from it. But I think when you're out there and you're constantly looking to seek, so there's a lot of that simplicity part that goes in there. But to me also, the internalizing has helped a lot. Yeah. So I think, and there's no age for that. Like most people today, when I'm doing a lot in the philanthropy space or in the giving back space, and everyone says, okay, but that's fine now you started. And when did you start? Five years. I'm saying, no, I started that 35 years ago mm-hmm. because there's no right time mm-hmm. to figure out yeah. what you need to do. Today's 35-year-old mm-hmm. is thinking very differently than when I was 35. Mm-hmm. There's no question about that. Right. Like light years differently. Mm-hmm. Not better, not worse, but differently. So find your own DNA on that. And you need to be highly... And I think, again, I go back to, if you've got a sense of entitlement, if mm-hmm. you can't accept what you've got, those are privileges that then you can spend 20 hours reading, mm-hmm. nothing will get sold. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit of a DNA change to understand that the world is going to go on without you and with you. Now the question is, with you, what difference can you make? So to your point about, you know, ultimate people should find hopefully three takeaways from this. So I think one is definitely this, you know, you talk about the dropping sense of entitlement. And second, finding time, whatever the 10, 20 hours of your investment in your continuous development will arrive at third point soon. But uh, you've, you know, a couple of times mentioned, you know, mental health. And yeah. also a lot of things you're talking about, they're all reflecting some kind of self-awareness. Yeah. What is your process of, and also your advice to people, like how do I, what can I do to improve my mental health and just develop more your self-awareness? Yeah, look, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... I, I came from a lower middle class background. I didn't do too much in education. I didn't have too much of, or didn't have any financial resources. And for me, my soft skills helped me get my self-confidence. Yeah. So for me, early days of mm-hmm. theater debates and mm-hmm. doing plays for a hobby, I think gave me the myself of self-confidence. You were acting? Yeah, I used to act on stage. I used to act on stage. I used to do front of camera mm-hmm. hosting. I think that part mm-hmm. serendipitously got me into media mm-hmm. because otherwise but it gave me my sense of confidence to sit here and have this conversation because so I think each one at that early stage you have to find your own sense of what I would call self-confidence mm-hmm. self-conviction because that's the only reservoir you have yeah. again I think as I said before we spend a fair amount of time trying to live other people's lives mm-hmm. within ourselves yeah. so I would say that it's not easy to do yeah. and from the outside because most of us reflect but it actually the, the tremendous lack of self-confidence is the only reason you would be living based on what you think, how do I want to project myself mm-hmm. into the world? Because I think the day of people saying, so, okay, hi, you're 60, how do you want to be remembered? Yeah. You know, what do you, does anyone want to see mm-hmm. on your epitaph? And I'm saying, why the hell would I be bothered yeah. about <laughs> right. what is in my epitaph? I'm here today. After I'm gone, I don't give a damn right. <laughs> what is in my epitaph. Today, all I want to be not remembered, but all I want to do is that like every moment of my life, I live to the fullest mm. and hopefully most of it on my terms. Yeah. So if you take that DNA and if you expand that to your different age group, you'll go for it. Mm. Yeah. But go for it because you want to go for it, not because how it appears to other people. So we've already, our third takeaway is that just somehow you'll figure out a way to not caring what other people think, not living other people's and life. Not caring in a non-empathetic caring. way, right. but not, but yeah, that kind of influence, I think yeah. we're living... 50% of our time we spend uh, trying to live mm. other people's yeah. views of what we should be. Right. Sometimes it could be parents mm. with the best meaning. Sometimes it could be family. Mm. Sometimes it's the outside world. The problem is the social media also puts right. an incredible amount of things. Yeah. It's a little bit like I say to all of all of us when we were school kids, right? That pressure was we were always living the life of different people in the classroom. Mm. And then our parents and how they would meet and who they felt right. they could say, my, my, my kid isn't... For, comes first, comes <laughs> third, or he's great at this, he's great at boxing. That pressure, I think, has yeah. to go. And that leads to what I would call the mental stress. Yeah. Right. So, Rani, you were talking about you know, how Upgrad started with this insight about that you need to continuously educate yourself to stay relevant in the modern world. 
uh, you you know, and you chose a model of offering basically full fledged degrees, you know, whether bachelor's degrees, master degrees in an online format, and a you know three year or four year degree program is also fairly expensive. That itself was also quite unconventional because you know when you pay that kind of dollar value, yeah, you expect to go to a physical campus, sit in a classroom, yeah. walk around the campus, and so on. So how you know how were you able to first of all make that choice and also you know make it work? You know there's now you know I don't know numbers, but you know huge number of people are yeah. able to do their higher education basically online. Yeah. Well, firstly, I think. There's a hundred-year-old legacy in industry mm-hmm. and an issue with with the universities. So yeah. they bring incredible amount of credibility mm-hmm. to the space, right? Yeah. So for our point of view, we originated as the facilitator, mm-hmm. the technology partner, the content creator, the ability to be able to transpose an offline experience into online. Now we can call it content and technology, but at the end of the day, it's a three sixty degree approach. So second, I would say is once you're in a job. I think 0.001% of the people can really afford and say, oh, I'm going to take two years off mm. and do my MBA or I'm going to take two years off and upskill myself. Mm. So that day is gone mm. because today with no job security also, leaving a job and coming back into the working professional cycle yeah. is off. So that's off the table. Mm. The third is actually affordability yeah. because when you're going back, the three things you happen, you're dropping your income, mm. you are relocating to a place of an offline center. Mm. So there's always the question of lodging and boarding. Yeah. It was not in your place of your choice. And the third is the actual curriculum, please. So if you look at those three elements, that is the problem we were trying to solve for. That is a working professional. There'll always be 0.001% that will have the luxury to yeah. be able to upskill themselves. But the other 99.9999% won't even have the opportunity because they have to continue with their job. So how do you create an online experience yeah. for exactly what is the same offline experience? In fact, I would say during COVID, it did us a disservice. The K-12 sector had its own hockey stick. Yeah. Now, I don't know what the stick is. It's a, a stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. right. Was that everyone assumed that, aha, okay, so getting on a Zoom call is really learning. But actually, it is a extremely intricate process. Yeah. Like one of the most successful parts of online learning today is peer-to-peer learning. Hmm. So I think what we redefined is that when you're looking at offline Faculty, which is obviously then highly respected, is your core. But today, faculty constitutes 30% of the online learning experience. 70% comes from industry professionals yeah. who become faculty. Yeah. But you and I can take courses on mm-hmm. things, we, but we always be a guest lecturer. Yeah. Yeah. But you are a guest lecturer in the offline space because of the time you can give. But in the online space, you're mm-hmm. faculty. Right. So converting... I think when we're looking at solving a problem for India or a country like yeah. Vietnam or even in the US, mm-hmm. what is the biggest challenge is actually getting that quality of faculty outside of the real estate investment, which people mm-hmm. can make. So suddenly you solve the entire faculty approach mm-hmm. and you bring, brought in a completely new dimension mm-hmm. because there's a certain structure teaching that faculty bring, yeah. but there's a completely different structure mm-hmm. of learning that industry professionals. Got so it. that was our second part mm-hmm. there. And third is technology can allow you to do peer-to-peer learning that even a classroom count. Sure, you can in a classroom have an interactive conversation, but actually how many interactive conversations can you have? Because there's a certain level you need to cover a curriculum in that. Here, every time in, if you are, are, are what I would call our classes with 600 students, and that would be tough in the offline space. But in the online space, having a 600 class of 600 people is not... The 600 people class is actually much more adventurous, much more participative than the class of 60 people. Mm. Because you post a question, yeah. five other companions are there, mm. somebody wants to do a s- study group. So if you now suddenly start to understand this ecosystem, yeah. you can understand mm. that it's not a competition of is online mm. better than offline. Yeah. It's a question of, I can't afford to mm. take a year off, right. and I'm getting a very different peer-to-peer mm. learning industry experts right. experience that I cannot get in the other yeah. space. So it's not an either or. Mm. In some ways, you know, it's the best of both worlds, right? I mean, it's funny, it's, it's cheaper because you're not relocating, you're not quitting your you know, everyday income. It's, it's also flexible. Cheaper. It's much cheaper. And, yeah. and the, you know, getting out of the professional world. Yeah. Right. Now, obviously, it's tough. Mm. It's tougher than taking a year off because now you've got your personal life and it's mostly at the age when you're forming and your family and your kids yeah. are young mm. and you've got a work life, which is also in the tough stage because you're just about building your career mm. and you're building that. Yeah. And now you've got to do that. So one is this, you know, working professional who are, you know, 
coming at it from continuous upgrading their skill mindset. But what about people, let's say, who are just starting to think about college? Like someone who is 19, 20 year old. Yeah. And I know you have enabled access to a lot of international universities also, yeah. which one can enroll studying here. So how should they think about that, you know, um, of in doing a degree through upgrad versus, let's say, doing a degree in a local college or somewhere in India, which is a physical, you know, four-year campus experience? It's a good experience, but there are limited seats mm. in the sense of the word. I think this allows you a multiplicity of choice. Mm. Actually, I would say that people who are doing some of our undergrad degrees, mm -hmm. 50% of them already work in professions mm. because your socioeconomic reason did not allow you to I maybe see. go in and do that. So mm -hmm. maybe from 12th standard, you went and started Got working. It. So now you can actually do that. Mm -hmm. We've had an incredible amount of students and come and said, I always wanted to do it from X university mm -hmm. or Mumbai university yeah. or Chandigarh university or D.Y. Patli university. And now suddenly they have the optionality to do it without relocating themselves. Yeah. And for example, the women, mm. unless you were a relative in that city, mm -hmm. you're not likely to be allowed to be moved to that city. Uh -huh. Now you don't have that. So the element of accessibility and a timetable of your choice mm -hmm. and your ability to now do it in your life is high. Yeah. So at 18, 19 and 20, I'm not recommending, therefore, mm -hmm. that if you, it's an either or. Mm -hmm. It's a different experience. If you want to start working, mm -hmm. you can do this parallel. Got it. Let me ask you one, you know, maybe a question which is based on live case. I was just talking to my niece a couple of days ago. She's preparing for JE, not very confident whether she will get into, and she's not right now, not even clear about other colleges. So, like, now that, you know, keeping upgrade in mind, what advice can I give her in terms of, you know, what kind of college, university options she can consider as an alternative in case, you know, she doesn't end up going through. Well, on a lighter note, I would advise you not to give advice to the younger generation. Fair, okay. All right. I think it's like, you know, your parents, you're telling them, I guarantee if you marry this girl or this uh, this boy, and you're going to be happy with okay, it. Just to be clear, she asked me for advice. Which not in an interactive <laughs> session, I think you can. Right. That here's a multiplicity of choices. Uh, right. Finally, it's her choice yeah. what she needs to mm -hmm. do. But if she had to map out her next five to ten yeah. years, and in that, if she feels mm -hmm. like today, when you wanted to get to your post-graduation mm -hmm. MBA, 20 years back or 10 years mm -hmm. back, it was like you just went into yeah. it. Then everyone said, no, maybe three years mm -hmm. of work experience, yeah. then do it. Right. So today, I think mm -hmm. in the real world, the ability to pick up real experience and contextualize your mm -hmm. learning is becoming extremely important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're going to pick up in yeah. the formal learning space, mm -hmm. if you're actually living life, not as a student mm -hmm. also, I think there's a distinct advantage. Got it, got it, fair. Uh, there's one who also ask you about Universities, you know, the, one would imagine that, you know, college and universities are very, in some of the old institutions, and they have certain way of thinking, which is hard to change. Yes. What is the process of convincing them to enabling and opening their entire program to be offered in an online format with the students who may be in the other part of the world? Was that a, you know, difficult journey to convince them? And so I think in the early days, I have to say that when we went across to the universities, we were talking about doing curriculums that they were not doing. Uh -huh. Because the beauty of online is that we are preempting careers of tomorrow. Yeah. So I think one of our first university relationships that we had where we started out data science, yeah. they were not doing data science. So to them, it was a plus plus. Yeah. So it was interesting to get some of their faculty. Then we said we we're going to get 70% industry mm -hmm. professionals. So your thawing can happen for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. One is you're not doing what you're doing. Yeah. Second, today, almost everyone feels that whatever my real estate will do, some stu some colleges have 10,000 capacity, but most is 800 to 1,900 yeah. capacity. Mm -hmm. But today, when you're solving a problem with scale, and if you want to move our GRE ratios, people yeah. are realizing that I can't go and do 4X of CapEx. Mm -hmm. So I might as well look at options yeah. of how my best, my brand, mm -hmm. my teaching pedagogy, my faculty, my knowledge, how do I put it into practice mm -hmm. and channelize it that more people can actually benefit and I can make it more accessible and affordable. So that penny is, dro is dropping very quickly with mm -hmm. most people. Got it. And how are you finding balance between, you know, the way university will offer like their curriculum, way of teaching, way of evaluating students versus, you know, all the infrastructure you have built in terms of augmenting the whole education experience, bringing all this industry professional. Like how do you blend the two so that even though I'm getting a degree from Mumbai University, or a university in the US, yet it's an experience which is yeah. designed and managed by Apple. Well, that's a good question. And all I would say is the structure, the design of the curriculum that comes to university is very strong. So your sandbox mm -hmm. is well established. Okay. Second is your assessment, your mm -hmm. grading. Yeah. 
your final exams, your midterm exams, that bottom of the level, what the university yeah. does has been done extremely well. So your ability to rate yourself, grade yourself yeah. is a very, very important part. Uh-huh. Now then in between is the technique of teaching uh-huh. and learning and how do you yeah. share that. And that in any case, I think, is <laughs> getting augmented because even in your classroom today, what you taught, if you taught it with the same tonality and yeah. the same text and the same textbook of five years back, you're not going to hold the attention of your learners. Right. To Got it. So that's where we bring that mm-hmm. complete sense of electricity into the whole. Got it. That can make a 2 plus 2 equal 22. <laughs> right. Got it. And um, how is the, in your opinion, how will the nature of education evolve over the next 5 to 10 years? You know, we are, and we are living in this very rapidly accelerating environment. Yeah. But also what you... Some things also don't change. So that balance of your, maybe some of the things about education may not change at all in 10 years. Yes. But and that's why I'm saying, I think education may not change. That's much. Okay. Continuous learning will. Okay. And I think we need to mm-hmm. segregate the two yeah. because there's a certain base camp mm-hmm. that can't change because right. we haven't gone through the base mm-hmm. camp. It's like getting into the army without going to yeah. the army school I mean, mm-hmm. or anywhere else or going to any forces or mm-hmm. any, you know, any, any basic part without training. Yeah. So that's elementary and that mm-hmm. would stay. Does that need to get augmented yeah. to be relevant to the context of mm-hmm. today? Yes. Right. And that's what the what I would call the brick and mortar play a very big role, very mm-hmm. important role. Yeah. But continuous learning should not be mixed up with education, mm-hmm. which can't be tinkered with too much. Right. But continuous learning has to be 100% flexible. Got it. Because continuous learning is different strokes for different folks. Right. Understood. Understood. Continuous learning is more in the context of where you are, what stage of life, yeah. what your current challenges and problems and where you would upgrade. Yeah. Uh, but uh, fundamentally how people are taught, you know, a lot of the the conceptual elements of that yeah. are not going to at least change very rapidly. They shouldn't. Right. They shouldn't. And I think that's the base camp. That's the foundation. So, which means in some other way to say very simply, the value of a degree 10 years from now will be, you know, as much as it is, you know, today. It will be different. We, it will be base camp. Mm. So, it, it, if it was at the top of your CV yeah. 30 mm. years back, yeah. it became the foot, Minimum it came middle of your CV. Now it might be yeah. an important criterion. Right. But it's a conversation where people want to know your background. Mm. People want to understand what your background was, mm. where you come from, from that right. perspective. What's your sense of overall in India, in terms of, I mean, now look, and we'll maybe a little bit talk about, India is, you know, poised at a very interesting juncture where, you know, in some way it looks like, you know, most of the stars are aligned for really India to transition from at some point a poor country to a developing country to potentially a developed country in the next 20, 30 years. And education obviously is going to be very critical. Very so where are we in the overall education infrastructure? Do we have enough colleges, universities, enough seat? No, on one hand, we talk about the demographic dividend, you know, median age between 28 years and so on, yeah. which means every year, I think the, if my numbers are correct, about 1.5 crore people cross the age of 18 every year. Yeah. And ideally, you will want at least half of them to get college degree. Yeah. I think today the number is not That's even, you know. Because right now our ratios are 25% right. of the people actually get into college or go into college. Right. Actually consume that. Yeah. So that delta, the how does it country get, needs yeah. to be at fifty, sixty percent? So how does that get get bridge? You know, what do, what is what needs to happen? You know, government. There's not too much that can happen in infrastructure mm-hmm. because it may need two, three, four hundred billion dollars, and I don't yeah. think anyone's going to put that in because if you want to look at it, and yeah. infrastructure alone won't solve it because without that, you need incredibly mm-hmm. trained faculty. Yeah. So you're not suddenly going to get the world's best teachers mm-hmm. to come in, and you don't need them. There's yeah. we're a wish for good work here mm-hmm. in some ways, yeah. but. Teaching has never been such an aspirational mm. profession in the past. Today it is. It was in the past. It yeah. still is. I believe it is. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying for a lot of people today moving into this. Yeah. So the optionality I'm giving you mm. and almost everybody else to actually, because of technology, yeah. be a teacher and contribute to mm. the ecosystem of the faculty yeah. is going to be one major part of that. Right. I think the second part definitely is whether we like it or not. And I think the government has aligned themselves yeah. and accepted that because the new education policy. Yeah talks about the fact mm. that accepting technology. I mean, today, yeah. between some of the ministries, they're harnessing artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. If you take the fintech, yeah. would you think the government would have gotten into any of these mm-hmm. things in the past? No. Right, but because they have, mm-hmm. from an Aadhaar, which was as yeah. basic to now, if you see the government has done, been a, played an incredibly strong foundation mm-hmm. and catalyst role. Yeah. The minute you put that, private sector comes right. in, mm-hmm. And of course, there'll be some clashes and some PPP. There are always some frictions and whatever else. But by and large, 
that's going to build the system. Okay. The third one is I don't think it needs to be as calendarized as everyone makes it out to be. You could be reaching sixty percent. Yeah, it's not that everyone at the age of eighteen mm. will have crossed right. that, and that's mm. the beauty about the system. You can still be right. a developed world, and you may not do it at eighteen. Maybe at twenty six or twenty seven, mm. people would have done that. But today in India, we picked up more mm. working environment right. experience than you would have in your formal education. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right, and that's outstanding. Actually, there's a very different way of looking at things. We want, let's say, you know, at least half the people to get college degree. But they can take next ten, fifteen years also. Maybe your know, socio-economic yeah. situation I mean, doesn't allow you. Maybe a little bit, but in that seven to ten year horizon, right. you could. Right. And actually, it's a much more pragmatic way mm-hmm. because sometimes you have to pace it. Yeah, right. You have to pace it to set those yeah. expectations because if you push a system here, there is no system for that. We will not have in the next decade that many trained faculty yeah. and that much of realistic. Mm-hmm. Today, if we look at even with universities. Mm-hmm. The aspiration universities are the ones in the right locations, but there are some in smaller locations that are not 100% full. Yeah. So when we look at infrastructure also saying it's peaked out, it's not. Mm. That way, per seats, there's a lot. But why are they not going there? Partly because of accommodation and whether I go there, it'll be a small town mm-hmm. or level of faculty right. or many other things. Yeah. Upgrade is one way you are creating you know, massive impact. But I think, you know, as you earlier mentioned, you've been doing impact only projects also for a long period of time uh, i think you know last time when i met you you know the the impact that swadesh is able to do is incredible so let's talk a bit about you know that journey like you know when did the thought start you know everything you mentioned earlier you've been doing this for 35 years and where are we now today with swadesh and the kind of impact you're able to yeah create? so in the, the quick line on that because i think i've said it uh, more often than not but yeah i started my early 20s yeah. both my wife now and whatever else, we were co-founders in the company mm-hmm. at that stage. So we started at a very early stage. But I would say the first definition for us is in a 10,000 square foot office that we rented. 1,000 square feet we gave to an old age home and a crash mm-hmm. in an orphanage. And that actually created the culture because yeah. it was the work-life balance mm-hmm. for most of our 31st, 30 employees mm-hmm. was after 7 o'clock hanging mm-hmm. in that 1,000 square yeah. feet. And then as it grew. Mm-hmm. So I would say that took... The DNA was there, the yeah. DNA of a balanced approach. And that thought process was very obvious to you because a lot of people think, oh, let me first make money. Once I have sizable, you know, everything is taken care of, then I'm going to start deploying it here. But you basically, at the start of your career, you said 10% of, you know, that. Because I got an opportunity to do it without saying, let me first get mm-hmm. money. So right. I think that's why, mm-hmm. to that extent. And today, if you ask me, I don't have an explanation of whether that was visionary or preemptive. Mm-hmm. That's just... How it happened. But you stayed with it throughout your life. It's not like, you know, you started. No, I stayed with it for a long time. Mm. Then the first employee we had in our foundation came from uh, the rural district of Raigad in Maharashtra. Mm. And she said, one fine day, just come for a drive with Mm. me. And I want to show you that there's a big water problem. Yeah. And we said, no, no, but we want to do something in education. She says, you're right. But first you come and see the water problem there. And then we realized that actually we don't solve the water problem. Mm. There's, you can't solve the education problem because the girl child is walking four miles yeah. a day. And this is the Indian story here. I'm not saying anything yeah. new there. So that's when the penny dropped on us uh-huh. at that stage that it needs to be a little bit of a holistic model because uh-huh. the problems that you're trying to solve, sometimes we look at it and say, I'll put all my resources yeah. into agriculture or mm-hmm. into building a school yeah. but or building a toilet. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, will the person use a toilet? Because there is a water problem. Yeah. And if any way they feel as a habit, it's not changed. They're not going to use that infrastructure. Uh So I think that was early days. We couldn't do much about it where we worked with a few villages Mm -hmm. and worked slowly, slowly on water development. But I think on my first Mm -hmm. final crossroad of exiting and having my first liquidity event when I sold um, UTV to Disney, I think that was the time Mm -hmm. when the crossroad was there because for the first time we had resources. Otherwise, I think I was pretty much on borrowed money. I think my daughter went to school and college mm. based on borrowed money <laughs> or mm. my learning on my insur- life insurance policy. Right. So that was the time where I think the reflection was, what do we now want to do to scale up? So ironically, we decided to scale up. Yeah. Ironically, the in the first year, when we spent a year, year and a half re-researching this whole space mm-hmm. and trying to figure out what people were doing in models. Mm-hmm. And one of the realizations was this incredible amount of work happening, voluntary work happening in the country. Yeah. You know, I think people talk about America being far ahead in philanthropy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they might be giving 1% to 2% of the GDP mm-hmm. of their, this thing, and ours may be 0.2%. Yeah. But if I look at that, I would say from what I've understood from statistics, 80% of that mm-hmm. goes towards um, universities yeah. and grants and the church. Mm-hmm. 
So that's a different environment yeah. from what it would go to here because there are different environments. Mm-hmm. So I think some of those realizations came to us. Yeah. We were very clear we wanted to do an execution foundation. As an entrepreneur, I just felt this was not oh, something it. that suddenly one wanted to give out, but one wanted to build something in that space. On a lighter note, if you like solving water problems, you'll probably need to do something for Bangalore because, you know, <laughs> we have like a shortage of water. Like I'm kidding you, like the place in OS stay. They are now creating down water for six hours. If you can believe, you know, the Silicon Valley of the of India and but that's the that irony of <laughs> we we you know we are a first world country, but some of our city planning yeah. we have to get we have to get we have right. to get something going. It's right in our face every day. You know, I grew up you know in very small town Haridwar, and you know there you used to like water will come for six hours a day. Yeah, but in twenty twenty four in Bangalore, yeah. having to relieve that is is quite something. But, you know, so coming to Swadesh, um, Ronnie, I think um, from what I understand, you know, the stated objective is to, you know, build these model villages and try to, you know, bring a lot of people out of poverty, you know, with a very systematic long-term <clears throat> approach. So can you explain, you know, how do you identify this? Yeah, I'll keep it pretty simple sure. because it's come through tens and thousands of failures and setbacks mm-hmm. and learnings for us over these last seven, eight years mm-hmm. to get to this model. But at the core of it, it is about empowering the community. Mm-hmm. So with the result that now today we don't enter that unless we follow a village development committee. Mm-hmm. If they don't have a village development committee and there's politics in that village, mm-hmm. we'll stay out okay. till they do that. Yeah. And we'll see to it that they meet some of the other people mm-hmm. where we made a lot of impact so they finally realize they need to do this that. This village development committee is a voluntary organization? It's, yeah, it's actually 10 people from that, mm-hmm. from that village that appoint a village development committee. Okay. It's like building a board of directors, mm-hmm. if you ask. Yeah. Of which at least 50% have to be women. And of the whole 10 people, at least 30% have to be youth yeah. and young people. We can't have old, old people. There. Yeah. Now, once they do that, and sometimes it takes a year to build mm-hmm. that village development committee because they've got politics and they say yeah. no, and then we stay out. But that core, they make their five-year plan. And okay. you help them make their five-year plan. Their five-year plan on basic existential issues mm-hmm. like water and sanitation. Yeah. Their kids and therefore education and health. Mm-hmm. And the third being livelihood. So that's our overall model. We sit down there, build with them, mm-hmm. and then be the catalyst to empower them. Yeah. So water and sanitation just gives you your basic infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Health and education mm-hmm. raises your aspiration. Yeah. Level. And livelihood makes you control your destiny. Mm-hmm. Because frankly, if you are not having, if the head of the family does not mm-hmm. feel that he has control of the destiny of his kids, and if he's only going to be based on government grants, yeah. That will never change. So, therefore, the focus on livelihood, and we look at, we look at an entire geography mm-hmm. in a concentric manner, okay. mini GDP approach. Mm-hmm. That whatever your infrastructure was. Right. So, our idea is to enter a place and try and exit within eight years, Got five, it. six, seven, eight years, depending on the target. Right. Because the other thing mm-hmm. we found when we were doing our research was people were doing incredible amount of great right. work, but doing it for the last thirty years. Yeah. And the first thing that struck me as an mm. entrepreneur, because that's what I would do, yeah. what's your ROI on whatever you mm. invest in? I'm saying, but if I've been doing it for 30 years, means obviously I'm not doing something right, because by now somebody else should have mm. taken it over and yeah. done it. Right, right. And I think that has mm. given us a lot more laser focused of the baton handing over and the community right. handing over, which is why if you don't have the village development committee, they're going to take it over. Uh-huh. And our job by the second or third year is to see that the government plays an important Mm -hmm. part because the government is very active. But trust deficit between Mm -hmm. community and government for historical reasons Mm -hmm. has been strong. If you build that, you can't really take this into a permanent structure with our government. So I think it's a formula that we've now done. I think it's a model for rural India. What does the model look like? um, So you say you take five to seven year horizon. Uh, if you're able to share, what kind of resources are required in a per village? I'm guessing varies from population, so for a particular so size. We're working in two different geographies. Yeah. One is about 2,200 villages. Another place, there's 2,000 villages. Total community would be about a million people, uh-huh. right, in that whole yeah. concentric right. geography is in there. So water and sanitation are the ones that mm-hmm. have the high okay. investment. Of right. that. After that, it's a self understanding because education is something where we will give the right support and then we need to. And is there a clear... You know, and like, you know, entrepreneurs speak, you know, clear success criteria, like after five years, yes. the metrics that you look at, which tells you that you covered a significant distance. Yeah. I mean, you need to have portable drinking water so that even the people who migrated out yeah. feel now I can come back. Sure. You need to be open defecation free completely, which is otherwise there's no point of yeah. having a toilet, which is attached to you. It's not a community right. toilet. Mm. In education, our benchmark is clearly that everyone needs to complete a minimum of 12 standards. Mm-hmm. 
and 50% have to be first class right. plus. Mm -hmm. And those ratios are half that when yeah. we started off in that. In health, we focused on key things. I think anemia, malnutrition on one side. Mm -hmm. The the girl child and therefore the mother of minus nine months to plus mm -hmm. three years and hand holding. Eye care, which mm -hmm. we take for granted, but yeah. actually is very empowering because mm -hmm. that's almost your entire self-confidence goes right. down. If your eyesight goes right. down and you're never gone and checked, mm -hmm. these are small aspects. Yeah. Right? So some key parameters in mm -hmm. health and then most important is livelihood. Mm -hmm. But our goal is whatever is your yeah. family income, it should be 4x of that mm -hmm. in the next period, in the, four, in the three to five to five years right. that are there, which is not that easy mm -hmm. because a third of our people don't have an earning member, right. don't own land. And maybe the sun has gone mm -hmm. somewhere into the city and gives back a yeah. little bit of... So it's a challenging environment, mm -hmm. but I think it's a model that we're at it. Got it's it. In incredibly challenging, mm -hmm. but incredibly mm -hmm. exciting. So today, the Swadesh Foundation is, you know, in some ways, you know, uh, doing something to improve the lives of these about a million odd people across these 4,000 villages. Yeah. W what's your thought process behind it? Or, or, or for some... Is the model at a point where other people can also learn from what you have done yes. and try to replicate yes. it? We'd like to do that. We yeah. haven't put a full process SOP and a manual yeah. to that thought process, but incredible amount of people are coming in there and working with us on that. So we'd like to document and make this yeah. into a model which people can follow. Mm -hmm. There's no question. So that would be, I think, one. The second one is we've now done the empowerment and the catalyst mm -hmm. part because with the Village Development Committee and the catalyst for the government, yeah. we made permanent change. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we call them dream villages when we go with the dream villages, we kind of exit it except for the little finger. Mm. We'll always have a little finger there where we'll have volunteers that will be there. Yeah. We have a Swadesh Mitra in each mm. village that is embedded maybe for life yeah. that allows us to give us a report card. If there's something degenerating that we can come back mm. and hold the VDC and the Village Development Committee responsible. Well, that's super inspiring. I think that's probably a whole podcast episode by itself. I really hope that I think um, other people are able to learn from your model. And now that you've done all the hard work of kind of doing the product market fit, hopefully, you know, maybe we can find, you know, other organizations from, you know, different parts of the country to come learn, adapt, we, you know. We got inspired from an organization that does much better work in mm -hmm. uh, Bangladesh yeah. called BRAC. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, so I think each one from there, you adapt and you do that. And I think for a lot of people today, they feel, but I won't make a difference. Right. I would say whatever you do, you can make right. it. No, super inspiring and I think you know for India to go anywhere the inclusive development is inclusive absolutely development critical right? you know, we, can't. we can't be a, right. absolutely a first world country right. unless we solve the problem with the other 400 right. 500 million but not only with grants yes. not only with everything else that the government is doing which is incredible yeah. because if the mind mm. is not aspirational yeah. and if 50% of our population mm. doesn't know what the definition of what do you want to do when you grow up for the kids mm -hmm. there, which we take for granted yeah. here. But for there, if you ask them, you can't have just five career choices. Mm -hmm. You need 50 career choices. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think aspiration level is right. a very soft and important factor and for that part right. of the country. And the focus on livelihood, you know, yeah. plays a big role in that. Changing gear, Rohan, I think last time I was meeting you, you were sharing that, you know, some people play golf for their free time. <laughs> you make movies in your free time. So this is, you know... Something you stayed with again, you know, for 40 plus years, you know, a big part of the entertainment industry in the country have done, you know, defining things in that space. But maybe let's start, you know, more what, what, what inspires you? Like, you know, how do you approach a new movie project? I mean, you have so much going on. So both, you know, what, what inspires you to find time? Today, today it's very different than what it was right. when I ran it professionally in as a business yeah. because they do a lot of things that you have to do. Mm -hmm. But today I think it's about stories I would like to tell yeah. because if it's a hobby, it's like the golf course. You yeah. choose your own tools and yeah. who you want to play with yeah. and who you want to uh, who you want to play at which golf course would be. So I think it's about the stories that one wants to tell. So, and I think the partners that one wants work works too, or the directors that one wants. Work. So these stories come to you. Or you go out and find the stories. Today, I think that it's a mix of both okay. today because I've been in the industry and sector enough, but it's also with the clarity of what one wants to do in a yeah. particular thing. So when we did a, you know, Uri Surgical Strike or right now we did a mm -hmm. biopic on Sam Manning show. Mm -hmm. and we've done a lot in the direct OTT space. Yes. I think the right mix and match, mm -hmm. it's always had a, it's had a, a definition because I think brands are created either where you're super stardom and super yeah. commercially successful and brands are not created if you're totally niche and want to talk only with very limited social yeah. messages. So I think the ability for being a little hutke. Mm -hmm. But also being true to what one wants to do is, I think, I have the luxury right. to do it at this stage. And that's what I'm doing. So you have the creative freedom and you can just pick the project that you want to, I, you know. 
to be created. Right. That. Yeah. And just going back to you know your UTP days, you know in those I think it was the most uh, professionally run setup that the country has seen. In the past, when entertainment industry was highly unorganized and concentrated on a few individuals. Yeah. And but you kind of came in a very professional, you know, approach, which later on I think other people have also tried to do. But what was you know just in those days? How did you think about that? You know, building an organization as opposed to like very most of the things I would say, which I tell people today when they're uh-huh. talking about, oh, but do I need to upgrade myself? And I said, you don't have a choice in your career. I would say I didn't have a choice. I wanted to build a B two C company. Yeah. For the first five seven years, it was a B two B company, UTV, mm-hmm. where we were doing things for other people, yeah. and the only reason for that is we had no funds. Uh-huh. So when you don't have funds, you can't run a B2C mm-hmm. business. You have to start with cost plus. Mm-hmm. But the minute we did have, and we had some investors and credibility, we wanted to move to a B2C mm-hmm. model. And you can't create a brand in media unless you're on the big screen, whether mm-hmm. you like it or not. Because yeah. today, we're not talking about our 10 broadcast channels mm-hmm. or Bindas or some of the yeah. incredibly breakout uh, programs we did called Emotion Atiyachar mm-hmm. that established a channel where MTV was a cult at one mm-hmm. stage. But we're not yeah. talking about that because it's still television, but mm-hmm. movies is big. Yeah. So I think the movies part was a, a no choice mm-hmm. if one wanted to build a brand. Yeah. Uh, the first five movies we did were complete disasters. So mm-hmm. I think everyone and everyone told us we should get five them. movies. Yeah, consecutively five movies. So I it think. takes a lot to yeah. just dig your heels and say right. I don't have a choice right. uh, in the matter. But the, I think the good part was was I was the outsider, uh, and I think that helped because yeah. that allowed you to look at it and look at things in a very different manner. Uh-huh. Because if you can't beat them, join them doesn't mm-hmm. work then you look at it very differently. I couldn't do what some of the other people in the industry have been doing so brilliantly uh-huh. and well and capturing the thought yeah. process. Uh, and I didn't come from the manner born. Right. That allowed us to therefore do a breakout mm-hmm. then and do movies like Swades, after mm-hmm. which we called our foundation Swades yes, Foundation right. or Laksh or Rangde Basanti or Barfi. Yeah, these are all like category defining movies. I yeah. mean, you know, the yeah, and small ones like a Wednesday or, you know, Coast Lagos like Coast. Mm-hmm. So at that stage, we could do a lot more things at that particular point in time mm-hmm. and experiment yeah. without being experimental. Mm-hmm. And if you compare, you know, your days of running YouTube where you're dealing with a lot of creative professionals, you know, all with probably some sense of entitlement and egos versus, you know, let's say upgrade, which is in a very different zone. What did it require to be a, you know, leader in that environment where just so many different type of people who come at, you know, very, very different, you know, vantage point? I think you need to be a good catalyst, which means you need to be a good listener. Yeah. And I think you need to be genuine about your intents mm-hmm. of what you want to do. And you're not threatening because if I'm a mm-hmm. if I'm a producer that wants to be a director, yeah. then I'm going to get my roles a little mixed up. Mm-hmm. But I think we always wanted to be the person who built and brought things together and be the catalyst role. So once everyone knows that's the role, yeah. then you need to talk sense, right? Mm-hmm. You can't talk, you can't yeah. just be one more. Yeah. So you have to bring something more to the table mm-hmm. than just money. And I think that's systematically what we did. A little bit of creative prowess, yeah. a little bit of the right cat, mm-hmm. a little bit of sensibility in what we want to do, right. a little bit of corporatization. So we sprinkle all of that mm-hmm. together. And I don't think it happened overnight. It yeah. took some time. Credibility mm-hmm. took five, seven, eight years. As I said, our first five movies were a complete disaster. Mm-hmm. So most people would have written that off. Yeah. So we were not starting from zero. We were mm-hmm. starting from minus five. Yeah. Uh, that part, you know, every time here is today, you know, we are here, you know, I mean, we have, you have, so many outstanding successes they will look back but you know all the failure that comes through you know that is no matter how many times we we'll repeat you know it's still it's a uh, pretty staggering to see because it's for somebody who wants to do something new knowing that i'm going to go through five failure over the next 10 years yeah it's just you know unthinkable and i'll give you a very reliable example to you because we started home shopping network in mm-hmm. the country before anyone else yeah and I wrote, it was called tele shopping network called mm-hmm. right, and we had bought Time on Doordarshan and mm. our first hit product was a chapati maker. Ah, okay, right. And that was early days. Mm. And then I went to HSN in uh-huh. the US and wanted to do tie-ups and all of that. Uh, and then the Draper and Bill Draper came in mm. and invested and then we moved into the digital space. Yeah. But after seven, eight years, I think it was very early days mm. at that stage. And if you ask me today, yeah. you can be a pioneer, but mm. if you miss time being a pioneer, right. then you're before your time. That's right. And I think at that stage... Postal code, ability to pay, mm-hmm. touch and feel was hugely, and I think you can you know reflect on that when you're looking at mm-hmm. companies that were built later on. If I stayed the course for another 10 years, yeah. I think I could have been 10x of Flipkart. Mm-hmm. But it's irrelevant right. because in that 10 years, I could have been broke and I could right. have been running away from this country from yeah. that. Mm-hmm. Oh, fair. So there are parallels of being too early also. Yeah. And right, Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And, but I want to tell you, so when people look at exits, mm-hmm. 
on one side, taking a hard call that you before your time is equally tough. Right. Correct. And that's where we miss out on mm. because, and then we start saying, if only. Yeah. I have no right. qualms in my mind that if only I'd stuck it out, okay. Kelly Shopping Network could have yeah. been bigger. Right. All the e-commerce players yeah. today because I would have been broken. Between. Right. No, absolutely right. You know, I think hindsight is, you know, is, is good from your intellectual it's perspective, intellectual. but in the, but taking a decision based on what you know yeah. and also, you know, exiting, you know, when some, because when you close something, then you can try something else. Correct. So sometimes just staying at something for 20 years may sound very heroic, Absolutely. but so many other opportunities yeah. will, you know, yeah. Yeah. pass you by. Just having spent, you know, so much time in the creative world, does it allow you to be a different type of, you know, business leader when you're doing something like, you I know? I think so. Yeah. I think so. I think so. I think it's a very, it's a very strong point and I, I do think so. I think at the stage that, that one is today in, in, in my mind that would circle, yeah, I would always look at the the disruptive sense. I think disruptive comes from being creative right. in many ways. So right. I think you break it up into different yeah. protoplasms and molecules in yeah. life when you look at things. Yeah, looking at things you've done, um, um, this this one quote I came across about Steve Jobs actually I really like, you know, I think Larry Ellison said he had the mind of an engineer and heart of an artist, uh, which shows, you know, the product that he has created, right? So yeah. in some ways, you know, probably that's yeah. an advantage yeah. that you have, right? Unfortunately, I don't have the credentials on the engineer part, but on the on the creative, yes, and maybe business would be the second one. So I think that's a different comment. Yeah, and I mean, but creative actually does. It makes an incredible difference on how you look at every single non-creative problem also and how to solve them. And I think by all accounts, I think, you know, building a business, you know, especially when the heavily tech enabled, it's more of an engineering mindset because you're still, you know, putting a lot of parts together, fitting them and making the different kind of equation, but you're trying to, you know, make it work. But the only way I would, because you brought up that point, yeah. it's a very relevant point. The creative process mm. is one of improvisation, right? Mm. And therefore, and the and the and the other what I would call the engineering process yeah. is a lot more set, right? Fair. And there's a lot more process. And I'm not saying there's right, there's good, right. but because you're in the non-linear world yeah. of creativity, mm -hmm. your ability to innovate and your right. ability to introspect is very good. Yeah. I think, you know, I mean, everything Rani you've done, I think super inspiring. You're still going very strong. I think I'm pretty sure you have a lot of interesting project uh, up your sleeve for, you know, coming years. But Hopefully I don't have projects up my sleeve. I think now it's the depth. Right. There's a lot to be done in Swadesh. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to be done in Upware. Right. And I think if I can continue to tell mm -hmm. stories at, at uh, in now is oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure. I think I'm at, pretty much, at the dashboard is right. set. You have the independence, you have the you know, energy and, uh, and you really enjoy doing and you're creating massive impact. You know, all your projects are very directly, including the movies, I mean, yeah. the, the recent movies. ones, they're also like creating impact at a very different scale, you know. So I think you've found that zone. I think uh, you've gone through your struggles, you know, have your successes, but you're able to channel all of that, you know, yeah. intellectual prowess and resources into really making, you know, serious impact, which is super inspiring, you know. I'm very thankful to you, Ronnie, for oh, taking your time. It's really good. Thank you for... All the work because I think we covered such a wide range of topics today. Thanks for your breadth of. I did the easy part. You actually have done all this in over the last forty plus years, so it was easy for me to code. But thanks so much, I thank you very much, and I hope it connects with with your. I'm sure. I'm sure people will be inspired. They will have a lot of uh, clear takeaways, yeah. and those you know three minute of actionable three things as well that you will be able to implement in their life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. stories of exponential impact. We share in-depth analysis of what goes behind success stories. If you find our conversations interesting, you can join us by subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can also listen to Sparks on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or any other audio platform of your choice. If you have any suggestions on who we should invite or what topics we need to cover, just let us know in the comments. We are always listening, looking for ways to improve, and keep getting better as we go along.